Welcome, everybody. I'm Karen Gimnig. I am the Associate Director of the Co-Housing Association, and Karen Hoskin is listening in from time with her family um, by phone, so she'll be pretty quiet, but she's the Executive Director, and we work together on keeping these things going. Um, the association, so that the web chats are hosted by the Co-Housing Association, and we are delighted to have all of you here. It's fun to get groups together and have your questions and sort of a diversity of perspectives is always wonderful. Um, and we're delighted to have Mary and Sarah with us to share their knowledge and wisdom. I want to give just a few introductory things. Um, one is just to note that these web chats are a free service of the Co-Housing Association. And that doesn't unfortunately mean that they come without cost. So. We don't ask people to pay for them, but if you'd like to donate to keep this sort of programming going, we welcome it. This is web chat number 20, which is pretty exciting. Uh, so welcome everyone, we're glad you're here. And we're particularly glad to welcome Mary and Sarah. Um, I'm told they first met when they moved into Great Oak Co-Housing in Ann Arbor back in 2003. And since then, they have learned a lot about working with communities, both from the communities they've lived in, their experience at Great Oak, um, and also their experience with neighbors at Sunward and Touchstone Co-Housing. And they are here to talk to us today about new member orientation and the five critical elements of a comprehensive and engaging new member orientation. And with that, I am gonna hand it off to the two of you. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Um, I am Mary King, and I'm one of the principal partners of We Can Work It Out. Sarah is the other partner, and we're glad to see you on the screen tonight. Uh, we have been living in Great Oak uh, co-housing community since 2003, and we're hoping to bring some of our experiences, not only from living at Great Oak co-housing, but we are also neighbors with two other co-housing communities, Touchstone co-housing and Sunward co-housing. And this presentation um, consolidates information and learnings that we've had from all three communities about how to create an effective, effective engaging and comprehensive new member orientation. Yep. Um, and, Sarah? And in addition, I'm Sarah. And uh, in addition to the experience we've had at Great Oak and with our neighboring communities, we've also done some trainings with Laird Schaub around facilitation and community governance. And so we wrap a lot of that into our thinking and our presentations as we work with other communities. And you may notice that Mary and I are broadcasting from two locations. So about a year ago, I moved to Iowa City, Iowa. And so I'm there and Mary's in Ann Arbor. And here in Iowa City, I am living just in a regular condo, breaks my heart, but I am getting to know the first co-housing community in Iowa City, Prairie Hill. So I'm getting to know folks from that community and share meals with them on occasion. And so I have kept in touch with my co-housing roots, which I miss dearly and uh, hope to return to sooner than later, so. We were hoping that we could manage uh, with this uh, Zoom program, uh, some brief introductions uh, if there's an opportunity, and hopefully Karen can help us out with this technologically, for everybody who's on the phone to let uh, us know your name and your community, where your community is located, and uh, how old it is, if it's in fact already been formed. Karen, can you help out with that? I can. Let's start with Cornerstone, and I, I will unmute you. I think No, I can't. You'll have to unmute yourself. Um, and if you just want to introduce yourselves and who's there. So we're Cornerstone Co-Housing. We've been here since 2001. I'm Susanna Schell. I'm Carol Agate. And I'd appreciate it if everybody would speak slowly. My name's Elizabeth Locke. And that's Molly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Pat, do you want to introduce yourself? And you need to unmute. Maybe I can. No, no, I, there you go. I've set it up so I can just hit the space bar, but I got to be in the same screen before I can do that. Right. I, I'm living currently in Lincoln, Mass, not too far from Cambridge, but I'm hoping to move to Rocky Corner in Bethany, Connecticut in July. We're building. We've built the first, we're, we're, we've built the first 10. We're working on selling the last 11. 
Excellent. Thelma? Hi, my name is Thelma. Uh, I'm in the Prairie Rivers co-housing group, but we're just a, a formation group. So we haven't been together that long and we're just really trying to get up to speed, learn what we should do and collect enough m members to actually make a group. So, so where is we're smart Prairie Rivers going to be? It's going to be in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Oh, thank you. And uh, we're on the hunt for property right now. So um, that that's so very early stages, really. Good luck to you. Yeah, what an exciting time. Thanks for it being is, here. Yeah, just can't move fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Linda Miller. Um, I'm at Elderberry Co-Housing Community, and that's in North Carolina, Rougemont, North Carolina. Um, the community has been active about five years, more or less, and it's 18 houses. It's also a senior community, a senior co-housing community. Wonderful. And Wendy? Linda, we can't see your face. Tilt your, try tilting. We have a nice view of your window. Um, I put my laptop up on something that's a little higher. Try tilting uh, so your screen down. Well because of the light in the room. So generally, you can't see my face. Okay. Okay. All right. No worries. Thank you. Wendy, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Wendy Pearl. I'm in the Waterloo Region Co-Housing, which is in Kitchener, Ontario. Um, but it's uh, forming, although ironically or perfectly, um, we are doing a membership recruitment tonight. We just had a potluck at our house uh, and there was a whole bunch of members there. Um, we've been around for three years now, three and a bit. And we're um, in the process we've been Gone, gotten incorporated and we're now looking for land and yeah that's where we're at great good luck to you thanks okay dean and i'm betting that's jenny with you yeah i i think the light be is behind us i don't can you see us oh no i can that's a little better okay what in here maybe Yeah. That, no, that's worse, isn't we, it? We have a nice sunny day here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're sitting by the window. So okay. yeah, I'm I'm Jenny Lindbergh. Dean Smith. And we're with um, Sunnyside Village Co-housing. We are a forming community. We have property. Um, we've been working on this for about five years. Um, we have a few members and property, so we we think we're doing really well. And we just um, are contracting with Karen Gimnig to uh, be our consultant, which we're very excited about. Really? And we're also going to the conference, which I'm very, very excited about. And, and can you say where is Sunnyside? Oh, it's in Marysville, Washington. Thank you. Oh, okay. Great. I just got a call from our tenant there. There was one house there that we rent, and she said that the bald eagle right next door to us has been out all day. They're sitting up on their nest. Uh, wow. Uh, <laughs> wow. Evelyn? Yes, I'm Evelyn Latore, and I'm part of a group that's been meeting monthly for the last six years in the San Francisco Bay Area in the Fremont, California Mission Peak Co-housing. And we also have been looking for land. There are about 10 of us that have been looking forever, it seems like. And uh, I don't know, maybe one day we'll find it. It's pretty wow. expensive out here. Yeah. 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 And Rick, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi. Uh, I live at the, in Minnesota at the Monterey Co-Housing Community uh, next to Minneapolis. And uh, we started out in 1992 with a big old building and uh, eight apartments. And then we... Uh, Three years later, we added seven more uh, condos next door uh, with a tunnel that connects us to the, that building. Wow. And now we're looking to expand and add uh, anywhere from four to eight more units. And uh, hopefully we'll get uh, a bunch of kids again. We had 12 kids before, but they, they grow up and move out. So. Yeah, it turns out. <laughs> and um, I, I, I had, 
I thought maybe maybe uh, this was going to be the one with uh, uh, Diane Leaf Christensen about um, uh, four kinds of uh, challenging behaviors. Did I miss that one, or is this? No, you're you're ahead. She's. Um, I'd have to look up the date, but it's right at the end of April. Okay. And the focus of this one is on new member. We're doing what we're talking about new member orientation and the importance of that early on, as well as sustaining a community that's established. Okay. Thank you. Great. And Oak Creek, do you want to say hello? Oak Creek is one of our faithful. They're, they're here most weeks with us and they're waving. Do you want to introduce yourselves? <laughs> no, they do not. They want to stay oh. muted. They're, you're in California, right? Oh. Okay. Very good. Janie, do you want to introduce yourself? Yourself? Hard to tell when we can't see. Marsha, do you want to say hello? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm Marsha Carlson. I'm at uh, Columbia Eco Village in Portland. Uh, and we've been here for 10 years. We have a number of rentals. And so we frequently have new people coming in. And I was just curious about uh, what kinds of advising you guys were putting out there. So thank you for having this webinar. And we'll see you soon, Marsha, because Mary and I are staying at Columbia Eco Village when we come out to the co-housing conference. <laughs> Fantastic. Wonderful. And Janie, it looks like you're with us now. Do you want to introduce yourself? I figured that. Yes, Janie Harper with um, the with two co-housing forming co-housing communities, uh, the Coastal Village and uh, the Mountain Village, and I'm in British Columbia. And uh, the group in uh, in the Sea to Sky Corridor. Hasn't found land yet, but the group's been meeting now for a year for me, and that's all going really well. And then on the Sunshine Coast, we've just been offered a site, um, and so we're now proceeding to look at the costs and dollars and cents, and really forming a strong community there. So that's yeah. great. Very great. Right. And Sharon. Can't see you, Sharon. Did you want to say to introduce yourself? Maybe not. Okay. I think I got everyone. Did I speak up if I missed you? All right. Well, Sarah is going to be loading up uh, a PowerPoint presentation that we're going to be using um, as we um, we chat with you today. Um, I just wanted to let folks know that. This is a kind of a brief, orient, a brief orientation. This is a brief overview of a much more robust presentation on creating an engaging, effective, and comprehensive new member orientation that we are planning to deliver over, I believe it's a half a day um, at the conference in May. Um, so we're gonna start out by telling, talking a little bit about that what we see as the two major purposes of um, a new member orientation, and that is welcoming new members, but also protecting, preserving, and passing on your community's culture, which Sarah is going to talk about a little bit more in just a minute. So when we, we talk about welcoming new members, we're really talking about opportunities for introducing them to the community, to their neighbors, opportunities um, around inviting them to um, participate in community life and not only inviting them to participate in your community life but also giving them the information and the tools that they need in order to be an active participant in your community. Sarah? So in addition to creating an orientation that feels welcoming, a really important thing that your new member orientation doing is is doing new member orientation is doing is it's protecting and preserving and passing along your community's culture and this is both informal unspoken norms and practices or if you're forming what are what are the values that you're practicing and working together as a group as you're meeting 
and formal agreements and proposals that your community has created and passed that help you live together well. And on both of these fronts, informal and formal, you want to be sure to include things that you've learned from experience may be sensitive areas for your group or your community because you're bringing somebody new in. So you want them at least to have a heads up, you know, for instance, you know, um, at Great Oak, if you park in the handicapped parking spot, even for like 10 minutes to run into the common house and grab something, you're going to hear from one of my neighbors because that's something that she's very attentive to and feel strongly about that that spot always be used in, in compliance with the expectation that you've got a sticker or a tag. So you're going to hear from her. So a new member might make that choice. And I just want them to have a heads up that, yeah, you're going to hear from someone about that. Um, as you trying to ease into living with a whole group of people that have been living together for a while. Um, for communities that are just forming, these kinds of things would be like, you know, we often socialize together outside of our regular meetings. And here's how we get in touch with each other. Um, or when we meet, we almost always bring snacks. So those kind of informal things that you've practices that you've developed, you want to ease people into those and help them be a part of them. And then in addition to that, there's, of course, if you have formal agreements about um, pet policies or ways that people are participating, expectations for how many meetings you're going to attend in a certain window of time, you want to make sure that people know about those things so that they can start to fit in in a way that's meeting the group's expectations uh, so things go smoothly and people are making good first impressions as much as they can. So I was wondering, for people who have been living together for a while, are there areas in your community that you're aware of that would be like one of these informal norms or expectations that you'd want to let folks know about? Does, does something jump to mind for anybody? We're trying to figure out how to make a webinar interactive. So yeah. let's, let's see what we can come up with. Yeah. How about the folks from Cornerstone? So we have so many things that are unspoken. It's really kind of hard to identify. Mm -hmm. The handicap thing kind of uh, rings true a little bit because we have one dedicated handicap space, but it's marked on the pavement. And so uh, if it's dark, you might not see it. So you kind of need to know that. We don't have assigned spaces. So some people, it's much more of an informal agreement that so-and-so likes to park over here. Yep. Um, you know, so that certainly parking is one thing. Well, and that's, I mean, I think that's a great example. Um, and and our, our point in bringing this up is that when people put together orientation packets or orientation presentations, they often focus on what are the written expectations or agreements. And sometimes it's those kinds of informal agreements that can really trip people up. So thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested too for the groups who are in the forming stage, because I know you probably meet regularly. Do you do you kind of have some informal practices in your groups that you've developed that come to mind that you let people know about when they when they join or come to meetings? I'm thinking, I know that there was a group that said, uh, someone said that they were meeting once a month and had been doing that for a number of years. So yeah. I'm Assuming that when you have new members come and participate in those monthly meetings, there are some things that you want to make sure that they know about your group. Okay. That's right. We'll go on. If you think yeah. of something, just put right. it in the chat because it's, it's really fun to hear from each other, uh, hear different experiences. Yeah. So, I, uh, I, next. Oh, oh they, I think she chimed in. Just go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was on mute and I was talking. Um, <laughs> In, in in Fremont, uh, we where we've been meeting regularly. The only informal thing I can think of is that we uh, you're expected to take your turn 
if you're comfortable at you know leading the meeting and doing different parts of it and the potlucks we have every month you just bring whatever you want to bring no signed things and that's so far that's the only thing i can think of those are good those are good examples yeah i think that ours actually are similar um at our meetings we have an agenda and i try to write things on the agenda that we're going to talk about it always starts with a check-in and always ends with a check out which kind of helps people get to know each other mm -hmm. so that's kind of a formal informal thing mm -hmm. that's a great practice to do yeah and one problem we have repeatedly is that we're having a business meeting and and some new person will come mm -hmm. they don't know anything about what yeah. we've done in the past they you know they're not up to speed and if we stop and bring them up to speed, then we don't get anything accomplished in the business meeting. So mm. we've made a rule that before somebody comes to a business meeting, they have to meet with me for an hour or so. And I kind of bring them up to speed. And so when they walk in, they're not taking up everybody else's time. This is helpful. We're going to actually touch on this a little bit farther into our presentation. So thanks for sharing that experience. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, I think we're going to talk now a little bit about this idea of, of the variety of first contacts. Right. So we want to impress upon folks that um, when you think about orienting new members, you kind of think outside of the box and, and include even your potential new members. So these are folks who are contacting your community to find out more about can I live there? Can I rent there? Can I come on a tour? And we want to encourage people to um use those opportunities to provide people with relevant and accurate information about your community as appropriate you don't want to get down into the weeds but you want people to start learning about what are some of your shared values some of the community norms so they have a chance to self-evaluate like is this community feel like it's going to be a good fit for me and then the other piece is around, you know, what are your work expectations? How do you do governments, governance? Because I'll, this is new for a lot of people, this way of living together and working together so intensively. And you want folks to kind of get an overview of what some of those expectations are. Again, so they can have realistic expectations. If they, if they move from becoming a potential member to becoming a new member, then from the very beginning, they've understood that, oh, I'm gonna have a work commitment or I'll probably participate uh, in a work group or a committee in some way. Um, so they sort of know what they're getting into from the beginning and this that makes that transition into becoming a member that much easier and smoother for everyone because there aren't big surprises you know once you're a member we're gonna lay this all on you think about what's appropriate to share with people early on Mary do you feel like did I cover that do you want to add anything to that I want to ask you to move the slide oh thank you yeah no problem um, and the the one the other piece that um we want to talk about that first contact where you're where you're trying to sell your community and promote your community this is the piece that sarah's saying is also around sustaining your community but it's also an opportunity to do some some pre-screening um so for example um during your first contact when you're giving people kind of realistic expectations about um, what it's like to live in community, you're giving people an opportunity to really reflect on, is this what they want? Um, is, is this really the, the, the way in which they want to live? Or did they just think that, you know, co-housing was like a cool idea, but didn't really understand what some of those commi the commitments are to living in co-housing? Right. And for groups that are forming, and so you don't have that living together experience necessarily right. to pass along, this has a lot to do with your values. What kind of values do you talk about as a group? And are you looking, you're looking for folks who are in the same, you know, they're in the same lane. You know, they don't have to think exactly like you, but that you need to know that it's gonna work out as you move together, as you continue to work together to make decisions that you've got values that are pointing you all generally in the same direction. And so talking about those at meetings, um, having, you know, three or four bullet points that you can share with people as you bring them into the group, 
um, and clarifying those as a group so you have something to offer folks is really important to, again, that sustaining piece because you want folks that are going to fit and you're going to be able to move ahead and keep working together. Sure. So when we say that orientation starts now, what we're saying is your orientation starts at the time of a first phone call, an inquiry, at the time when you're doing marketing, uh, a marketing table or a presentation. It starts if you're currently living in community and someone brings a, a visitor around, even if it's a family member or a friend, they could be a potential new member. It starts, of course, while you're giving a tour. And the orientation also starts when people are coming to their first uh, community meal. And ways to really encourage that is by um, having a designated greeter at for someone's first meeting, but also a designated eater. So somebody who is making a commitment to come and sit down with a new family or new individuals, introduce them to other people at the table and perhaps introducing them to everyone um, in the room. Um, it's also an opportunity to start talking about what are the formal and informal agreements that you have set around your meals, your meals program, how the meal will proceed, what do people do to clear their table uh, when the meal is over, what are those kinds of expectations? And Mary, I just want to add, like, yep. if we know if we do this, like, because we have a membership committee and they usually find out, they usually host people who are, in, you know, potential new members. And they'll reach out to the community, like if it's a family, they might reach out to a couple of families and say, hey, are you planning to eat on this night because we have a potential new member coming? Would you be willing to sit with them? Or if it's a retired person, they might reach out to another household that's similar. Because then they've got at least a bridge to do some shared experience and shared like like what it's going to be like to live in co-housing for their cohort. Um, so we're, we're fairly intentional about that. And then the last uh, point of first contact and, and, and another place in which orientation starts now is at the first community meeting. And this is, you know, this is something that, that Dean was talking about earlier. Um, and that is that the first community meeting is obviously an, an opportunity for people to meet other people who are part of the community, but that it's really important prior to that meeting to be able to have a, a chance to sit down and, and talk to folks about what they can expect is going to happen during that community meeting. How, what does the agenda look like? How does it flow? What are the kinds of, what is the, are the, uh, the mechanisms for which, by which you're making uh, decisions? What is the role of your facilitator? Do you have other roles that typically occur during a meeting, like a, a scribe, and what do they do, a, a note taker or a stacker? Um, so you're, the person is really kind of participating in a piece of orientation. They're having an active experience of, of how your community functions during that, that first uh, community meeting that they're attending. Yeah. And in addition to you know, giving them kind of an overview before the meeting, if you have a few minutes after the meeting to sit with them and see, do I have any questions? You know, like, oh, what were they doing? Or that was amazing. Or I couldn't believe, you know, you get a chance to um, share with them a little bit more about your process. And again, this isn't about going into the weeds and getting into all the detail, but it is about using this opportunity kind of like as a teaching moment, right? They're there, they're having the experience, they're absorbing it just by being there. And that's really a part of their getting oriented to the community are those first experiences of being with everybody. Great. All right, we're gonna go on. So we want to rename our presentation because as we've been working on it, we realized there's three components that we really feel like a new member orientation needs to have. And that needs that is it needs to be engaging, it needs to be effective, and it needs to be comprehensive. So we're going to talk about each one of those three qualities. So engaging, a new member orientation we feel is engaging when it has personal contact, like there's one-on-one -on -one contact between the new member and uh, an already member or more than one me already members. So you want to definitely create an opportunity for people to meet people, to have face-to-face -face conversation. This is a part of the welcoming part, I think, of a new member orientation because you feel welcomed when you get to know someone and they're telling you some of their funny experiences in community and 
they're asking about the new member and getting to know the new member. So engaging is really about having some person-to-person -person contact. You don't just want to hand somebody the new member packet and say, hey, call me if you have any questions. You, you know, you want to sit down with them. I don't know if you, you don't want to necessarily go through it page by page, but you do want to have that opportunity for relationship building and just starting to get to know the new member. And then the other, the other way that you can do this to make it really engaging, I think, is to have a tour of some kind, um, a tour of common areas. And during that tour, you can share some of the unspoken norms or practices like, um, you know, around the community garden, we actually have some quiet hours because there's some units that are close to the community garden. Here's the community garden, isn't it wonderful? Um, here's the play area. We ex one of the expectations is that um, any toys left out are within this area so that people aren't tricky, tripping over them on the sidewalk. So show them around the community, you know, help them get comfortable being there and understanding how the different common areas are used and what some of the informal norms are around those. And if you're not currently living in the community, but you do have information about a potential site, or even if you have some drawings to show people, it's really well, and it sounds like a lot of folks have already got the engaging thing going on in those forming communities because you've got regular meetings, yeah. you've got potlucks, and that's, you know, the relationship building. So I think one of the challenges once you're settled into community is you've kind of, sometimes you kind of get your neighbors that you relate to more often. And when new people come in, you need to be mindful about introducing yourself and starting to include them in your circle. So there's different challenges at different stages in community. So I think the, the forming people probably have the engaging thing pretty well covered is my guess. So the next thing that a new uh, member orientation needs to be is effective. And we define effective in four different ways. So the first thing is that it actually happens. <laughs> That's important. Um, because we've certainly struggled over the years with how to make sure that every single person who comes into our community actually gets an orientation. Our community has both um, owner members and we also have renter members. And sometimes the renter members can cycle in and out fairly quickly. So you have to be able to catch them uh, before um, before it's too late and they've come in, they kind of slid under the radar and then are walking around the community with not really a good idea of what's going on. So you wanna make sure that it actually happens and there are often some logistical challenges around that because an orientation takes a little bit of time. Our orientation here, we catch people on for two one hour slots. And so sometimes just the you know scheduling logistics, figuring out the weekend or the evening when we can do that uh, can be challenging, but super important. And so for forming communities, this is also an important issue. And, and, and to get to the next point that Mary's going to make too, you might have some, and you, maybe you do have some written materials so that you know when somebody new comes in, there's a point at which you want to make sure they've been exposed to some information and that they don't slide under the radar and miss out on some of the agreements and parts of your process as it continues to unfold. The second thing that makes your orientation effective is that you are delivering the same information to every new member. And what that means is that you have some kind of a checklist or a format that you're using, which of course will be updated with new information, but that you're making sure that you're hitting all the same points with each person. So you want to you want to standardize it because that is a piece of what makes it effective. The third thing that makes it effective is identifying what are the topics that people need to know about just to get up and running? Because you're gonna have some written materials, uh, hopefully a handbook or something that they can really look over when they have more time. But what you want in your in-person meetings is like what are the five key things that people absolutely need to know to be up and running and be able to participate effectively in this community. And it's a balancing act, right? Between giving people the information that they need and not exhausting them during um, their, their time uh, in the in-person orientation. And that kind of leads us to the fourth piece of what makes an effective orientation, and, and that is, is that you're using a variety of formats. 
your orientation has written materials, it has in-person materials, hopefully there's a tour attached. We do things around demonstrations and tutorials. We have a kitchen tutorial that we use. Um, we have a, a decision-making PowerPoint that we present uh, so that we know that, that people understand how it is that we come to decisions. Um, so those are kind of the four pieces of making your orientation effective. And this is some of the stuff we're gonna go more in depth on at the workshop at the, that we're giving at the conference on the new member orientation. So like Mary said at the top, this is kind of an overview of, of some of, of how we think about new, or, new member orientations. And then we're gonna go more in depth like with checklists, um, that kind of thing, and, and managing that tension, that balance between just enough information and like too much information that it's not effective anymore because it's overwhelming. So where do you, where's that balance and how do you get people up and running in a way that feels comfortable? Um, and then the last issue we talk about is, is, it, is it needs to be comprehensive. So, and that really is about the written materials that are available. So there is a difference between your new member orientation and your written new member packet. The written new member packet goes into the weeds. You know, it has all of the details. It, it might have, uh, you know, sunset clauses from proposals, when they're going to be reconsidered, just a lot, a lot of detail. You're not going to overwhelm people with that in a personal presentation. So the new member orientation piece is the person to person, the tours, that, that information that's the most important for them to get initially in the first month or two when they move in. And then some of the other orientation stuff gets spread out a little bit more over time because it's not as critical that people get it right up front. Like at Great Oak, we'll offer a kitchen tutorial maybe twice a year and people can come and sign up for it. Now maybe somebody's worked in the kitchen a couple of times before they take it, but then they can come and really get the lowdown on where everything is. Um, but we don't necessarily, I don't know, do we, we don't necessarily do that right up front, but we offer that to them in the first couple, three months when they're there. Um, and then one of the struggles, one of the challenges with a new member packet can be keeping it up to date. And so we're going to talk about that also in the workshop. What are some techniques and practices that can help you make sure that's up to date enough so that it's relevant and helpful. Um, because we know from living in co-housing, you might pass a policy or, or even a norm starts to develop in response to a, a proposal that was passed. And that now needs to be kind of written down and shared with your new members in your packet. And so we need to find a way to make sure those kinds of things get into those materials. So I just want to summarize that during this webinar, some of the things that we covered are what are the two purposes of a new member orientation, how new orientation really starts with your first contacts, and then what are the three components of a good new member orientation that it's engaging, that it's effective, and that it's comprehensive. And as Sarah said, we'll get more into the weeds during the, the three-hour session that we'll be um, facilitating uh, during the conference. And we have a lot of handouts uh, that folks can utilize. Our goal is, is that you actually leave that session with a mock-up of what your new member orientation would look like uh, after the session. So we hope you'll join us. And we want to open it. Uh, now for questions and answers. Will that session be on Friday at the yeah. conference? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think it's I think it's Friday morning. I is don't remember. I think it is. And that's a half day intensive. Is that right? Yeah. That's correct. Someone at Quarterstone, Suzanne has a question. Elizabeth, will you be able to share uh, that material online somehow for those of us who are not able to come to the, the uh, conference? Karen, we are going to post our handouts to the website. Are people who aren't registered, do they have access to those, the materials that the presenters post? Do you know? or? 
I think so. You're also welcome to send me anything and I will post it in association with this web chat. So anything that you okay. want to share in that way, I can get up on the website so you guys can decide yeah, what you want to what you want to share where. Um, okay. I think that the material I think that the conference website is open in that way, but I am not 100% sure. I, I am not on that conference team. So Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. We'll talk together and we'll talk with Karen about the best, the best way to make things available to other folks. Do others have questions? I, I sort of joke that this is the, you know, ask a facilitator moment. <laughs> <laughs> if you two are open to sort of open-ended questions. Sure. Oh, yeah, sure. So if you have if you have some other burning question about living in community or facilitation or more specifics about the orientation, this is your chance. Or Corey challenges Stone. or tips that you have that you want to share from your own experience. Looks like Cornerstone has their hand raised. Okay, so we've been living here since 2001. We don't have a lot of turnover, so we don't have a formal orientation. Um, we've talked about creating one and um what we've tended to do is someone will move in and they'll be matched with a buddy maybe the most immediate neighbor so orientation in that sense is very idiosyncratic so i think we probably are talking about creating something um and i'm not sure if you have some recommendations on where would you start since we don't have anything that's like really formal. So we have experimented with the buddy system ourselves at Great Oak for a while. That was how we oriented people. Um, I think we found, we had one, we have a member who was very interested in taking on new member stuff. So that was really helpful. We had someone who wanted to just put some attention and time and thought into it. So that helped us. And I think we've had enough turnover that it really became valuable to us to have a consistent new member orientation. So I would start honestly with a list of what are those things that you think people need to know to participate in community life in the first two months, two to three months that they're there. Probably stuff about your meals program, stuff about real day-to-day -day stuff, parking, where do I take out my trash, what's the Work expectations. Yeah, stuff, you know, as soon as they get there, they're going to be doing this. They're going to be parking their car. They're going to be dealing with their pets. They're going to be wanting to eat meals. Um, so you want to give them that information up front. And I would say, you know, you could make a checklist that your buddies use, um, you know, to make sure they cover all these points. Because that consistency piece starts to become pretty important in terms of, getting people transitioned in in a way that feels comfortable so and i don't i don't know if anybody from cornerstone has is interested in signing up for the intensive but one of the things that we're going to be doing is we actually have put together worksheets that helps to guide you through what are the key sections that you need to have in a new member orientation and then we've developed questions that you can answer and when you're done answering those questions you'll have in place kind of the component pieces. And our hope during the intensive is that as we're doing that together, people are gonna be learning from each other mm -hmm. within that workshop. So it would be wonderful to see you there. Because one of the challenges really about, you know, offering a new member orientation workshop is that every community is so different. And so what really works for us and is appropriate for us at Great Oak, you know, might not really fit that well for another community that has you know you don't have as much turnover so what's going to make sense for you but what we feel we really can offer is we've put some thought into it and so we can at least give you the lay of the land and then as you look over that you'll have a sense from your own experience in your community about what really makes sense to pay attention to what's important for us to pass along to our new members so what we're gonna what will help you with is to develop a structure how you fill that structure in will be individual and unique to your community. Other questions? Yeah, I just, I have a comment. I'll, I'll bet it would be useful to talk to, if, if you didn't have an orientation, to talk to some former new members 
people who had recently joined and say, what do you wish you, we would have told you? That's, That's great. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Love it. Now, I'm interested in folks from the communities that are still forming. What kinds of things were you hoping to hear or you know, get some input on from coming to this? Have we touched on those things or are there areas that you're interested in um, getting support around that we haven't addressed yet? Hi, it's Judy. I'm from Waterloo. Hi, Judy. Um, so we're just forming and we're, um, we have a foundational sort of a group of households and we're, we are at a time when we're going to invite new people to come and we do have a, an orientation meeting set up and a lot of the things that you're talking about is very helpful, it supports what we're going. We find that people come and are very interested and know a lot about living in community but um, how do you talk, how do you um, do the screening around financial viability? So we were talking about um, how do we know that people who are interested in becoming members will be able to um, uh, have an, enough finances because we're going to be building and it's going to be, we're at that expensive uh, point. Do you have a price range that, uh, that you know about yet or is it still pretty wide open? No, we have a range. Okay, all right. It's hard to talk about money. Yeah, I mean, I would go. Mary, did you want to follow up with that? You can, you can start, sure, and I'll, I'll, I'll follow up I after mean, I that. I think the, the first step is, uh, is making money a part of the conversation. Just have it be something on your checklist, um, and talk and talk about that price range, you know. And then you might want to see, you know, this is what it's going to cost. This is kind of the timeline of when you would need to get a loan, when you would need to put a down payment, so on. You might offer that because people can self-screen with that. Um, and if it's possible, I, you know, I don't know, are there resources? Are you working with a bank that's more co-housing friendly? Do you have any recommendations that you can offer people uh, that way as they start working through the process and answer, getting the questions they need answered? Mary, do you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I, I do think that um, that including that price range in any of your written materials um, and certainly in um, a first conversations with folks will be helpful. That, that you know, the tricky part is is other than telling people and, and uh, what you think the unit prices are going to come in as. There's not really much else that you can do around screening people for income because, for example. Um, you know, especially if your community, if from the time somebody comes in to the time it move in might be two years or three years, people's income can change dramatically in those two to three years. Mm -hmm. um, that certainly happened um, in our community. So people who thought that they would be able to afford to move in when the time came, they were not. And, but the opposite thing happened too, that there were people who thought that they were going to be able to scrape by and get in. And three years later, when it was time for move in, their income situation had improved. So I just think being real, as transparent as you can be about pricing as soon as you know, even if it's just like a big range, like you know that your units are going to probably start at 300,000, you know, just put that out there and people will self-select. And I want to say, too, Mary made me think of something, because I know also, as Great Oak was forming and moving towards that, you know, I need to make my purchase now, as people got to know each other in those, was it four, two years, Mary, three years of planning prior? Yeah. Um, people got to know each other, and people had shared enough and were trusting each other enough that there were folks are like, well, let's be housemates. Let's yeah. buy a house together. Because I can't afford it myself, I don't think, and you can't. And so there was some creative problem solving that happened out of those relationships that had developed. So making an opportunity in a way that feels comfortable for folks, like maybe just to go around, like what's, where am I at? What are my hopes and dreams? Financially, how am I getting myself ready to move into co-housing? Because if people are able to share that with each other, and as things move down the road, who knows what creative solutions people might find to support each other to be able to move in. And that really does happen in a way that people really feel good about, you know, and are making good agreements about. 
That's right. And that, re that also reminds me, Sarah, that people also had conversations about renting right from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. They were super interested. They knew they couldn't afford to move into a unit. So they started talking uh, with some of the folks who were planning to move in to see if they were interested in renting out a bedroom or in our particular community, we, some folks have, um, well, we all have basements. Most of us have basements. Some have walkout basements. So to make those kind of informal arrangements too. Mm -hmm. So put it on the list and, and just, you know, start talking about, find ways to start talking about finances. Thelma, I th think I saw you had a hand up earlier. Did you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you. I did. And really, because we're in the early stages, I'm more interested in the sort of process and, and the order of process. And that is in terms of, uh, okay, you come together as a group. That's what you want to do. Is the order uh, to uh, get your financials in order, incorporate, and then look for, for a place? Like, what, what would you recommend as that process? Like, what are the steps? that you need to focus on for that. Because there's some discussion, like some people just seem to want to go around endlessly in circles and some of us really want to move on and, and like move through the process. So um, there's some discussion about, well, we can't, there's no point in, you know, doing the financial stuff or incorporating because we don't have any land, but you can't have any land unless you incorporate in, in my view. So if you have comment on that, that would be most helpful. Okay, Karen, do you have a comment on that piece? That's really more of a development issue. That, that, was, that was gonna be my comment, is that okay. this, is, this is the point at which you likely would want to check in with a development consultant. Um, and you know, you'd wanna talk to them, but my, my understanding is that often those folks will have just an, an initial conversation for not a lot of money, just to sort of begin to connect and get a little bit realistic. Um, yeah. And, but, and that's yeah. the other, it, uh, sorry to interrupt, that's the other issue too, is that some people think, well, we could just do this ourselves and we don't need to spend the money on a co-housing consultant. So, right. Okay, <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would try to disabuse them of that notion right away because to have a healthy community, you're going to need a lot of outside help and not just around development because, one, you know, because there's this third piece, you know, that, um, that I think, is needs to be added to that your conversation right there's the piece around the finances there's the piece around the development but there's also the piece around community life and developing your community Vision culture making. and yeah. that is just as important as figuring out the right piece of land yeah yeah Good. Good. Thank, you. thank you very much that, that's very helpful I mean, those, those folks who think they maybe don't need support from the outside i mean my my question would be, have you developed a multi-million dollar project before with other, using other people's money? Because that would be enough to make me want to get outside. Oh, no. you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Well, we are, we are already near the end of our hour. I don't know how that happened quite that quickly. You guys had so many cool things to say. And it was great to get everyone chiming in or many people chiming in and hearing from different folks. So thank you all. Um, as I'm wrapping up, I do give a few announcements at the end. One is, as we've mentioned, the Portland Conference. We are letting people know if you're on the fence about coming, it's time to decide. Mm -hmm. um, it's very exciting in the land of co-housing and the association that we think we probably are going to have a sellout conference. So oh. our, our <laughs> guess is that the numbers shift a little bit. We found a little snafu in our calculations, so we aren't quite as close to that as we at one point thought we were, but we're pretty sure that we're gonna, there will be a point at which you can no longer buy a registration to the conference. So if you're thinking, oh, I'll probably register, but I can just do it later, uh, we wanna make sure you get the word out because we'd hate for you to be planning to come and then not be able to get a registration, but there is kind of a firm number of chairs that we can fit in the ballroom kind of story. So um, that's just to be known, but also very exciting. We're expecting a lot of yeah. just phenomenal I good I want to make a pitch too for people to go to the conference because I've been to two other co-housing conferences before, you know, the opportunity to present in Portland. And it's just really exciting. You're around, you're like around people for two whole days. And those people are thinking about co-housing all the time, just like you are. <laughs> and, uh, 
and it's really fun. There's just a lot of resources, informal conversations you'll have with people, great workshops on topics that you're interested in. It's really worth going if you can make the opportunity to do that. Yeah, I would echo all of that and say, I also think the particular team that we have putting this conference together is outstanding. What they have done and come together, there's some new things that they're incorporating, and I think it's going to be an incredible conference. I'm very excited about it. So know that. Um, the link to that website is in the chat, so you can look for that there. Also, next weekend, already a week and a half on Sunday is the co-housing open house day and last count I had there were 61 communities opening up so that people can visit so um, particularly you forming communities you'll want to get out and visit some other folks if you're not hosting your own uh, it's a great opportunity to get to know co-housing communities and I will say of, of all the things that is just so valuable to forming communities the more that people have actually walked into co-housing communities and gotten a feel for how they work and what they like and what they like about one and what they didn't like about another, that is just invaluable as you're putting your community together. So any opportunity that you have to do that. And National Co-Housing Day is once a year and a fabulous opportunity to see those communities. Um, and I think that's, oh, and our next web chat I wanted to tell you about is Joe Cole. It's next Tuesday, on the, that's April 23rd. And he's gonna be talking about addressing racism and working for racial equality in community. So I think that's gonna be a fascinating one for any group at any stage. I think we tend to run into those questions. So that's what I have for tonight. So we will wrap it up and see you all hopefully next Tuesday with Joe and in person at the conference in Portland. Um, the see end you of, in Portland. End of May. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.